heard about how this came about. It's obviously 50 years post-1968 in a series of worldwide events, um, at least in Paris, but uh, at a host of other places. And when one thinks of 68, I mean, one immediately conjures the kind of, you know, what, what we've come to call the global north, uh, and yet uh, events globally um, in the 60s uh, were at least as important as any taking place uh, in the global north when you think about the anti-colonial movements, the independence movements, uh, the various liberation movements and so on uh, that were at work <coughs> across the, uh, the, the planet at the time. Uh, the image on the poster uh, is from a photograph, it's a painting um, from a well-known photograph, we don't have it, but the, um, of uh, the wife of Patrice de Mumba, uh, upon his arrest and disappearance, her garments rented uh, off the top of her body as she herself was placed under arrest. Um, as a, a well-known photograph that was recreated as a painting by the wonderful artist Marlene Dumas, uh, formerly of South Africa, now living in Amsterdam, who happened to be also a long-standing college friend of mine. Um, so uh, this uh, forum came about when Googie and I bumped into each other, bumped into each other in the hallways of ECHRI. He, he was wandering around our hallways, as he's known to do from time to time. <laughs> and um, we were just chatting, uh, and somehow Gayatri's name came up. And Googie said to me, oh, I met Gayatri in 1966. <laughs> right, for the first time. And that sort of transported us, us back into the 60s and what was happening in 1966, which was also the year of the famous Hopkins post-structuralism conference, uh, the, um, a range of other uh, compelling theory events of the, of the moment in the time, uh, linked of course to uh, the range of political events of foot in the day. Uh, and we looked at each other and said, oh, we should really do something about this, yeah. right? And uh, we invited around and Akbar's around to put them all together in conversation. And so today is the, <coughs> the, um, the outcome of that happenstance uh, conversation. Um, our three speakers need very little introduction to an audience at UCI. They are all, in one way or another, faculty members in comparative literature and other things at UC Irvine. Um, they are uh, professors at this institution and others. Uh, they are hugely well published uh, in uh, one variation or another, so I'm not going to rehearse all of that. You came to hear what they have to say, not uh, a rehearsal of their biographies. Uh, Gurgi's, the title of Gurgi's talk, this is a kind of insider joke, is the Hosman of the 60s, which would make Gayatri's talk the critique of the reason of the Hosman of the 60s. And Akbar's talk, uh, the disappearance, whether of the Hosman of the 60s remains to be filmed. <laughs> Uh, why don't we start off with Gurgi and then Akbar and then Gayatri. Thank you very much. This should be a really simple end. You know, first of all, let me say just sheer pleasure and uh, we are having this conversation uh, of the 60s. Uh, it is difficult sometimes to, to talk about a period uh, which has been part of your life. Uh, in fact, right now, I've been contemplating writing my uh, fourth or fifth memoir. <laughs> uh, my last memoir, I know, uh, 
birth of a dream weaver ends in 1964. So I was thinking of writing the next one to do with the second half of the 60s. Yeah. And Barbara has been doing a lot of research. So today she came with notebook so she can take notes from everybody <laughs> for my memoir. Uh, um, I was also looking for a particular picture, which is not available, uh, with me either on a horse or parting a horse in Aya. Okay. So the best thing, because I have a tendency of telling stories, and it can take a lot of time. So I'm going to read some remarks from my prepared paper, and then we see how I go from there. <clears throat> my paper is called The Colonial Theory and the Horseman of the 60s. Uh, David just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, no, seriously, it's the colonial theory and the horseman of the 60s. Actually, the whole saga began last Saturday uh, when Gayatri Spivak signed a copy of Breast Stories, one of her English translations of the work of Mahasweta Devi with the inscription to the horseman of the 60s. So I said, ah, you, you have given me the title for my talk. I told her excitedly, except that when I tried to make something of it, nothing really would form. <laughs> Still, it made me time travel back to 1966. That was my first visit to New York, or for that matter, any part of this country. I was into my postgraduate studies in Leeds, UK, and also in the middle of my third novel, A Grain of Wheat. And here I was, landing in JFK as a regional guest of honor from Africa for the International Pen Conference that was being held in New York. Arthur Miller was then president of the International Pen, and the American Pen Center was kind of the host pen. Uh, the idea really of the conference was some kind of to bridge the Cold War divide. And writers from what was then called Eastern Bloc were among those allowed into the country, despite, of course, their communist connections. But that's the whole idea, uh, that, you know, bring the two sides of the Cold War in a spirit of free sort of expression of ideas. There was a large contingent, I remember, of Latin American writers that included uh, Pablo Neruda, Carlos Fuentes, Mario Vargas Llosa, uh, but the only one I really remember because I met him was Pablo Neruda. Uh, <coughs> uh, I want to give you a little bit of picture. I had just published two novels, Weep Not Child, in 1964. The River Between, 1965. But despite this, and also my being invited to the gathering of this global literary elite, I would not call myself a writer. I stuck to my student <coughs> status. But still, I enjoyed the gathering, even tried a few poses, you know, like how. <laughs> yes, I do know. <laughs> Remember, I met yeah, you, you then. Know, like how, how do writers, how do writers 
feel it. Is it like that? Or is it like that? Or uh, uh, tap? <laughs> right? Um, so even thread a few poses to make me feel a writer and project myself as a writer. To be very frank, I was so much into those poses <laughs> that I hardly followed the proceedings. <laughs> <laughs> Until one of the last events, a panel discussion presided over by other Miller, uh, which included Pablo Neruda and Ignatius Sloan, or Sloan, uh, the Italian author of Bread and Wine. I was in a crowd, again deep in my Socratic pose, and it's the, that, that's when I heard, from that pose I heard something Ignatius Sloan complain uh, about the lack or the dearth, lack of translations of contemporary Italian right works into English. And this is what I had when he added this. And you know, Italian is not like one of these Bantu languages with one or two words in their vocabulary. <laughs> My Socratic pose was gone. <laughs> You see, I was guest of honor pre present a continent that was emerging out of colonial bondage. Ghana <laughs> and the Kwame Nkrumah had gained independence in 1957. Uh, but in the early 60s, this was followed by many others, you know, Nigeria, Tanzania, too, Congo, you know, Lumumba, you mentioned Lumumba, you know, it's a kind of cluster uh, of so something was really happening, like popcorn, boop, independence, boop, independence. Uh, and now in the space of the 60s, uh, some even called it, uh, my own country, Kenya, became independent in 1963, I think. Uh, some called it the decade of Africa. African writers themselves were coming of age uh, with names like Peter Abrahams from South Africa, and uh, who had been writing and publishing literally since 1946, uh, and new others like Kino Achebe, Walsho Inka, and slightly older ones from the French-speaking countries, Senegal. You know, they were making a mark in the world. Huh? The famous Makere Writers Conference of English Expression, in which I was a participant actually had been held in Makere, where I was a student then in 1962, you know, so all, um, this, the Makere one, was the first major conference, or writer's conference, held on the continent. Others, like the Black Writer's Congresses, had been held in Rome and Paris, I think, in 1956 and 1958. Um, in her talk yesterday, Gatri was referring to those uh, very important landmark black congresses, but they were held outside the continent. This one was held in, 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 in Uganda uh, at the time, so it's a very, very uh, significant. Um, with attendance also by people like Langston Hughes were also there you know, uh, at that particular conference. Yeah. So all this was showcasing, you know, in a sense, you know, the emerging African writers. And now, this Africa in New York was under attack, the Africa I was representing. So I stood up to defend the honor of the continent. Africa had many languages and I assured the audience that these languages had certainly more than two words in their vocabulary. To his credit, Adam Miller was very diplomatic. 
he said people could praise their own languages, but they did not have to badmouth other people's languages. You know, that you can do, just praise yours, but don't sort of put down the others. And I like that. Yeah. So I felt slightly better. Yeah. But no more poses, of course. <laughs> I felt slightly better for having defended the literary honor of the continent. And after the conference, I was ready to enjoy the rest of my tour of the USA. Still, that particular tour had really conflicting emotions about the USA, about this country. On one hand, there was a USA which had seen, and not talk about the history, of course, but also a USA which had recently seen the assassinations of David K., you know, and Martin Luther King. There was a play, I remember, at Leeds University, which all around that, which is circulating a rewrite of Macbeth, circulating in Leeds at the time, in which Johnson or was depicted as a Macbeth uh, and his wife as Lady Macbeth uh, with Kennedy as the other, or, you know, the story. But this Johnson had also signed the 1964 Voting Rights Act, which gave African American people the right to vote, again, just like the continent. And I really, it's very important that people realize how many, the parallels between African uh, history and African America is very incredibly close, even though people have experienced two different continents. You, know, uh, you can see certain stages in the development of Africa are reflected here and the other way around. You know, uh, uh, So 1964, Voting Rights Act was the same time that many African countries were also getting the right to vote for the first time, yeah. Uh, there was also the America that waged colonial wars in Vietnam. Uh. But then, and at what leads in other places, there was a lot of anti-Vietnam protests and so on. But then when I came here, I found, to my surprise, many Americans who were equally opposed to the war, if not more so than I was. Uh best symbolized by the activities of the students for a democratic society, you know. This I found very interesting. This on one hand, the imperial image of America, on the other hand, the fervent in the, the energy in the streets, you know, uh, opposing uh, that imperial uh, reach uh, and happening in the same country. You know. uh, and it was with these emotions that I visited Iowa, the home of the famous International Writers' Workshop. At the Engels, the founder, I think it's Engels? Engels. Engels, Engels, yes. Engels, the founder of the workshop, gave a reception for guests from Africa. Actually, I remember we had three of us, one Ghana, one, one from Ghana, one from Nigeria, eh? and me from Kenya, probably a few others. Among the attendees for that dinner or luncheon at his house was who? Gatrice Pivak, you know, this young, beautiful, and more so she was assistant professor of English <laughs> in Iowa. Hmm? <laughs> oh, Don't she's here? Days. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, she doesn't resemble no, uh, that person uh, anymore. Uh, uh, <laughs> Um, she, most important, she was among those who witnessed my horse riding skills. <laughs> and I had asked Barbara to bring a picture of me with, on, on the horses, but her parents' picture has appeared in one of our computers, you know, but I was going to bring it to show you my a friend. Horse, horse riding <laughs> skills. You know. But now, secret. I had never ridden a horse in my life. <laughs> and when Angus took us out to see his table, I was markedly reluctant to get on the back of any horse. Eventually, they got me a pony. <laughs> so 
I was so scared, I sat spread eagled on the, <laughs> on the, on the horse. Uh, and I was mighty glad when eventually I got off. That was a horseman of the 60s to whom Gayatri inscribed her translations of Devi. Very important. So I'll come back to this later. So I returned to Leeds University to my studies, to my Franz Fanon, who, and Franz Fanon again, a very important figure in the 60s. You might explain a little bit here why I mentioned him. Uh, but very, very, very briefly, we can come back to this in conversation. Some of us, like, who grew up in Kenya, in a settler, uh, white, dominated community, you know, uh, we're so much used to seeing politics and power in terms of white and black. Because for all practical purposes, in Kenya, white was power, white was wealth white was privilege, you know. And on the whole, black was poverty. It was lack of privilege, you know. So white and black became very good figures for, you know, for describing the reality of the country, you know. Uh, but so independence brought about a sense of expectation of change, something is going to change, you know, in a dramatic fashion, I believe. Uh, but then you began to see other things. The social discrepancy between the wealth and the poor was beginning and actually increasing and so on. And s some of us, despite having written two novels and there's several, I'd already written published two, eight, two novels. You know, I'd published about eight or ten short stories and I was but despite all that, I didn't really have, for me personally, a vocabulary by which to understand this new phenomenon and be able to describe it. You can see it, you don't have the, so much you don't quite understand it and so on. Uh, and quite frankly, it's Fanon. And not, and not even Marx could explain it for me, uh, but it was Fanon the wretched of the earth that gave some of the vocabulary by which we were able to look at what was happening and make a sense of it, you know. Particular chapter Gatry was referring to called the pitfalls of national consciousness, you know. Um, so I returned to Leeds to my studies to my Franz Fanon and guess to my novel. What? My novel? Yeah. But in what language was I writing it? English. But I just come from New York, where I waxed ecstatic about the richness of African languages. That was my first real major internal struggle over English. And at one time, I even contemplated giving up on the novel or giving up writing altogether. In fact, I'm quoted in an interview as saying precisely like that. You know, uh, and the question I was asking myself was, for whom am I writing? Okay. Yeah. The question was not resolved. And the novel, a grain of wheat, came out in English in 1967, I believe, yeah. I was in Beirut, Lebanon, to yet another conference when it came out. It's called Afro-Asian Writers Conference. Very different experience. You know, New York one, the now it's framed by uh, this other one, Afro Asian writers, writers from all over Africa, Asia, you know, sort of, of Vietnam. I mean, sort of, sort of like an, another world, you know. Uh, uh, and this time I didn't have to pose so much. Huh? 
<laughs> and this is where I would meet a whole new community of writers from Africa and Asia, such as Fais, 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 A Fais, I think he has two Faises, uh, uh, Mukaraj Anad, you know, uh, among others. Uh, uh. If at the Penn Conference in New York, I was aware of the Cold War politics as background. In the Beirut gathering, I became aware of other issues. I visited a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon, which left a large impact on me or mark on me because it reminded me of similar scenes of dislocation and desolation in Kenya that I now describe in my memoir, Dreams in a Time of War. I also witnessed something else, pamphlets circulating outside the official proceedings that described the, the then Soviet Union as, a new word for me, social imperialism. Yeah. In other words, there was conflict going on. You know, uh, there were delegates from Russia, because Russia has also Asian side of it. You know. But on the side of the conference, and I, quite, I didn't understand this a little bit initially, was some Chinese uh, you know, activist or, you know, who were passing, taking me on the side and giving us leaflets, attacking Soviet uh, social imperialism. Now, uh, so it's a little bit confusing, uh, but as you look at both the Cold War and also internal or whatever, you know, uh, other divisions within the then, you know, socialist uh, blog. Mm. Uh, but the main impact was just the interaction with all these writers from Asia and Africa. In short, I had become aware of a much bigger literal world, well beyond that which was framed by say, William Shakespeare and T.S. Eliot, or Spencer and Spender, that framework by which English studies were organized, literally a study of English national literature, okay? Uh, not even a study of English literature, so national literature. In a way, that's these two conferences, New York in 1966 and Beirut in 1967, framed my experience or the later half of the 60s. But I did not realize their impact on me until I returned to Kenya in 1968 and joined the English department of the University of Nairobi. I'm not going into too much details because I've written quite a lot about this in a lot of my books. But within a year, I was in deep debate about the English department in Africa. I joined two other faculty and called for the abolition of the English department. A bit foolhardy. <laughs> 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 I was only there for one year. <laughs> and I was calling for my losing a job. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we, uh, abolition of the English department, um, which but the document is now available, actually, in uh, our collection of post-colonial reader and all that. A very important document has turned out to be because the first shot, one of the earliest shots in what would come post-colonial uh, studies. But we, uh, uh, so, nineteen sixty-eight for me was not just the Paris of student revolt and thwarted the revolution, but that of our revolt against the dominance of the English and European studies in our literally and intellectual universe. We, and I want to emphasize this because I'm a, remember, I'm a professor of comparative literature and English, please, yeah? uh, here. We were not calling for the abolition of English or European literature. We were really questioning the organization of literally knowledge 
in Africa or any knowledge for that matter. I believe that Nairobi University was among the very first to offer her literary studies with African, Asian, Latin America, African American, Caribbean literature, and then European literatures, including Yellow American literature, you know, and the, but in that order, you know, the order, here the, the key thing is really the order in the, the relationship not exclusion, but the order of their relationship, yeah. And <clears throat> what now goes under the name of post-colonial literatures and theories. Um, but our own theory, which, at the time, which arose really out of practice, really more than out of anything else, our theory was based on the concept of the center. Was Europe the center of our being, or was Africa the center of our being? In other words, it was not just a question of knowledge per se, but the order of that knowledge. The colonial and imperial system had decreed that the cognitive process began in the imperial centers and spread outwards to Africa, Asia, and generally the formerly colonized world. And we're saying, no, 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 no. We're saying that the normal cognitive process begins wherever people are uh, and spread outwards in a dialectical process of give and take. You know, uh, where you are, you add. The new knowledge of adding makes you see the old knowledge slightly differently. And the new, so this kind of, this kind of multiplier effect of this dialectical process and so on. But it's beginning from where you are. Mm. This, too, the question of language and the question of the center have been at the heart of my literary and theoretical explorations ever since, the results of which can be seen in my books, such as Decolonizing the Mind, Sounding Torn and New, and Global Ethics, and in my eventually giving up English as the main language of my creative work like poetry, fiction, and drama. My position was this, I can write in Gikoyo, my mother tongue, and reach the world just in the same way as Shakespeare wrote in English, Cervantes in Spanish, or Dante in his native Tuscan, and still reach the world, yeah. That's why the inscription to the horseman of the 60s rang a bell. So recalling all those things. Um, the book Ghastly was signing was written in Bengali by one of the leading Bengali writers. Uh, she is also a compatriot of Tagore, again, who wrote in Bengali. Tagore actually is very important in my life. Way back in 1978, for languishing, while languishing in a maximum security prison for writing a play in Igekoyo and having it performed by working men and women of the village, I came ac across a story attributed to Tagore in which a young writer visits him and brags of the many languages he knew, in the many languages all over the world. I don't know whether it's true or not, but in, apparently he knew many languages. Um, Tagore asks him, do you know after hearing him nodding probably, I don't I can imagine him sort of, mm, very good. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, then he asks, yeah, hey, but do you know your mother tongue? He says, oh, no. <laughs> then according to the story, Tagore tells him, then you don't know any language at all. This actually, whatever it was, was very, very important. It's been very, very important to me, that, that whole relationship of knowledge, you know. Um, uh, uh, this, among others, may have contributed to what I like to call, following Athusia, my epistemological break 
with the past in practice and theory. I embrace the Koyo language as my primary language of creativity and penned my first ever novel in the Koyo, Devil on the Cross, on famously so toilet paper. Not the type advertised on television, those bears, very soft ones, not like those ones. Mm -hmm. These were meant to punish uh, <laughs> prisoners, I believe. Uh, and my thoughts on the unequal power relationship between, the unequal power relationship between languages was what would eventually become the colonized mind. Many of the thoughts I was thinking in prison, uh, the colonized mind that came out in 1986, a concept now embraced uh, in, uh, or at the center of uh, the colonial studies and aesthetics emerging in many parts of the world. Um, in South Africa, it is at the center of the call for decolonizing institutions and for fundamental changes in the economy, politics, and culture. I believe that the language question is still fundamental to questions of change. Uh, and by the way, I was very pleased in your talk the other day, you ended up with the question of language. And um, that, yeah. The question is this, very simple for me. If you believe in the people, in the people, if you believe that they are base of change, it's not possible. If you believe so, if you believe in the people, any the people, then the question of knowledge and information being available in their language is fundamental. And this sort of complete divorce of the intellectuals of the colonized world, particularly in Africa, where the entire intellectual elite, the entire intellectual elite, you know, do their intellectual production in English or French and so on, you know. Yeah, has in about, you know, fighting up. Uh, so I believe, yeah, in the, when I came here, uh, and I started, I found, was founding director of, um, or not founding, well, one of the director of the ICWT. Uh, we had a news magazine called From Here to There. There comes from here, not the other way around. The colonial one is there to here, or he said, no, no. No, it comes from here to there. Whatever you are, you know, here to there. Uh, not there comes from here, not the other way around. It comes to this. Knowledge begins where one is, including one's own body. All systems of repression anywhere begin by alienating the oppressed from that fact. Alienate them from their own bodies even, their economic, political and cultural environment in total. Language is therefore at the heart of the struggles for change. Last year, the Los Angeles Review of Books headlined an interview with me with the title, A Language Warrior. Now, wherever I go, from Spain to India to Auckland, Venice, and so on, the question is often raised. Oh, tell us more about your experience as a language warrior. <laughs> Some, some I feel accept me to see, to see me a warrior on a horse, swords drawn, ready to do battle with the imperial beings on behalf of marginalized languages. You know, uh, in the reality, I have not, I have not, I had not yet ridden a horse. When in 1906, I stood up at the at the New York University where the conference was being held, and rejected the claim that African languages had only one or two words in their vocabulary. Still, the moment is important in my life, in creative writing and also in theory. Thank you. Um, time, but it is, it looks like it's about. Yeah.
Um, I don't have a biography, but uh, listening to Googie uh, reminds me of one biographical detail which I want to start off with, which is that uh, uh, as a, a student in Hong Kong, uh, we uh, were English teachers from England and who taught us English and so on and so on. And my moment of uh, language epiphany or, or colonial epiphany came when I realized that uh, the, these English teachers did not understand English literature. I mean, they, mm. could, they could explain the language to you, but they can't explain uh, 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 literature. And uh, th that was something that was uh, sort of quite important to me for the, in the 60s. So let, uh, I also have a prepared paper, but maybe it's probably best to describe it as an unprepared paper. And I'm thinking here of uh, Lewis Carroll, right, who said, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the birthday presents and uh, this other class of things which are unbirthday presents, <laughs> which are just as in, could be just as interesting. I mean, anyway, <laughs> let, let me just quickly start, right? And I'll start uh, like uh, Wikipedia fashion by uh, disambiguating the, the, the title, right? Because what I want to discuss is not, not a state of theory in the 60s, but how theory emerges when we try to understand the culture and politics behind major events of the period. For example, Hong Kong in the 60s, which is what I would uh, 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 propose to focus on, had no theory to speak of. Um, uh, though, uh, um, um, you know, like other places, it can provide its own sources and resources uh, for theory. And the question is, you know, finding these sources and resources. Now, there are, of course, many different uh, 1960s, each with its own set of defining events. In the USA, one main source of imagery for the 60s, it was the Vietnam War, the fight against sexism and racism, the celebration of youth culture, and so on and so forth. In France, another major source of 60s imagery, it was the refusal of consumerism and the spectacle uh, together with the attempt to reinvent subjectivity. Uh, that culminated uh, perhaps in the events of 68, uh, where one of, uh, and it's one of its best known slogans was, uh, be realistic, demand the impossible. Now in Hong Kong, it, it was the little known riots of 1966, followed by the uh, more severe riots of 1967. Uh, in, inspired, in fact, by the Cultural Revolution on the mainland that uh, precipitated a rethinking uh, of colonialism and democracy in that part of the world. Now, one question we can ask uh, about the uh, theoretical legacy of the, uh, of the 1960s, uh, uh, you know, with, with its uh, liberationist uh, critiques and so on, uh, is the following one. Um, have these critiques failed us? Have these discourses, uh, 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 in, in the words of someone like T.S. Eliot, who of course is politically con concerned, have these discourses, to quote Eliot, uh, deceived us or deceived themselves, bequeathing us merely a receipt for deceit? Now, it can be argued, for example, that it is exactly the liberationist discourses that have paradoxically prepared the ground for new conservatism. And the, and the fearful symmetry between uh, these liberationist discourse and new conservatism would include, uh, on the one hand, a distrust and rejection of big government, right, of the authority of cultural elites, of uh, the ruthlessness of corporate capitalism, and so on. And on the other hand, uh, a trust only in individualism and, uh, and the family. And some of these antinomies are also part of today's, uh, 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 you know, the, the present administration in the USA. Now, the, it, it, for the second example, uh, um, uh, the Bohr's critique of the spectacle, which he published in 1967, uh, was, of course, as we know, enormously influential on the, uh, on the events of May 68. But 20 years uh, later, after a great deal of cultural and political agitation. He publishes in 1988, right, a year before 89, 
a radically different book, which is comments on the society of the spectacle, whose main uh, 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 critical theme is how, to quote him now, the empty debate of the spectacle is thus <coughs> organized by the spectacle itself. Right, so it's, it's, it's just these turns and twists that uh, we also have to sort of uh, take out. Of. So it seems to me, however, that what these two examples suggest is not that the 60s have failed us, or that uh, uh, these discourses have, have, have failed, bequeathing us a receipt for de deceit, but that the theoretical legacy of the 60s uh, has to be seen to be a double legacy. Right. First, it demonstrated the necessity of critique for a democratic society, and that's something uh, permanently useful. But secondly, it showed, I think, just as importantly, that for critique not to become a form of critical piety, critique itself has to be critiqued. Right? And nothing is more pious, uh, unfortunately, than radical pieties. Now, let me try to follow this, uh, uh, this uh, double legacy very quickly in, uh, into my third example, which is Hong Kong in the, uh, in the 1960s. Like when uh, Chris Patton, the last uh, governor of Hong Kong, arrived in the territory in 1992, he insisted, I suppose rightly, that colonialism in Hong Kong uh, at that point could no longer be associated with old style uh, uh, exploitation and oppression. Now, this was already true of Hong Kong in the 60s, which as a result of the, uh, uh, of the flight of capital and human resources from uh, uh, China after the 49 revolution, was fast becoming uh, 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 very much uh, an international city, right? Well on the way to becoming what, what it is now. The colonial administration uh, treated the uh, social and uh, political uh, and demographic, demographic problems that, uh, and, and, and opportunities that this gave rise to of uh, post-49 Hong Kong as strictly administrative problems. It's a question of how to deal, how to administer these problems. It, it is because of this focus on, shall we say, managing diversity and not on representative government or democracy that the colonial city can be seen uh, uh, as a kind of rough template for the global city. Uh, it was something that prepared you uh, 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 for this other kind of city uh, that today some people call it global city. However, even though the, uh, the, man, uh, the, uh, the markers of colonialism seem to be blurring, this did not mean uh, that it had become a thing of the past, an ex-colonialism, EX. Rather, like the Boer spectacle, it was already mutating under pressure uh, of new paradigms into something else, into a form of what we might call ex-colonialism, ex, right? Ex as in the ex-files. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of uh, 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 whose family resemblance to the older colonialism is almost unrecognizable. So the ex in the ex-colonial can suggest a number of things. Uh, the X is perhaps marking the scene of a crime, which is what it was, uh, uh, of colonialism as still an unknown quantity, and raising questions like, uh, can colonialism be democratic? Or uh, uh, another question, uh, can certain uh, uh, versions of democracy be uh, a form of colonialism? Now, in the 60s, uh, um, uh, Mao described Hong Kong once in his inimitably pungent language as a pimple on the backside of China, right? That, that was his view of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of Hong Kong. Uh, but this description, I think, can be taken uh, to be not just a put down, but another uh, 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 wrinkle uh, in the way in which we understand the ex-colonial. Because what was decisive for Hong Kong's rise as an international city, I would argue, was not just uh, capital and human resources uh, finding a refuge in Hong Kong. I mean, it, that was, of course, important too. It was also, paradoxically, Hong Kong's dependent position and, its, uh, and the way it made a career 
out of dependency, uh, of being, as it were, a mere pimple. Right? So, so the pimple as, as this new political strategy that you can use. Now, in one respect, Hong Kong was, uh, uh, in this one respect, Hong Kong was very different from uh, a city like Shanghai, right? Because even at its most corrupt and sycophantic, there was al always some, uh, in Shanghai, there was always some vestigial interest in nationalism as a means of liberation. I mean, there was always this, this underlying discourse. In Hong Kong, there was no possibility and hence little interest in nationalism. It could never be a city nation uh, like, uh, uh, like Singapore, uh, for example, because both Britain and China would forbid it. Uh, it could therefore only be what we might call a hyphenation, right? Not a nation, <laughs> but a hyphenation. Nice. Uh, so in fact, it accepted its dependent status uh, uh, as an a priori, and worked uh, and worked with that. Right? Now the real theorists, I'm coming to there now, the real theorists uh, of Hong Kong in the 60s, uh, um, the films uh, uh, of someone like uh, Wong Kar Wai, right? uh, Wong Kar Wai, I, I would see him as the theorist of 1960s uh, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, he made these films in the, in, in the 90s, and, uh, and his most famous work, of course, is this trilogy uh, set in Hong Kong in the 60s, uh, of which uh, In the Mood for Love uh, is perhaps the most representative uh, example. And, these, and in these films, culture and politics uh, are there, but they're traced, as it were, uh, uh, sideways, as well. They're, they're only, you only see them uh, through the way in which affective relationships uh, uh, are shown in these films. And if you, if you, I think most of you have seen at least one or two of these films. Now, in many of his films, what uh, 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 Wong Kar Wai explores is not how love, for example, uh, love relationships, not how love ends in disappointment, Right? which of course is a kind of banal cynicism to say that you fall in love, you get married, you get divorced, disappointment. But how disappointment can be the basis for a different kind of love. Right? How disappointment can be, in a sense, erotic. How there can be an erotics of disappointment. And one of the um, finest examples of this, of course, is In the Mood for Love. Because if you just think about the, the story, right? in that film, the two main characters played by uh, Mei Cheng and Tony Leung are next door neighbors, drawn to each other because they're both being deceived by their spouses, their spies, maybe. <laughs> However, they refuse to be lovers because, as they tell each other, we don't want to be like them. And what the don't want, where the don't want, as it were, right, this negative is, in a sense, the strongest form of desire. Unlike affairs that end in disappointment, this is an affair that begins in disappointment. Because what draws these two people together is also what keeps them apart, and vice versa. Producing a structure of, of proximity without intimacy that is repeated in scene after scene, each one uh, precisely setting the tone for the film's special mood for love. Now, the question that I want to quickly ask and jump to is this question, uh, is, uh, uh, can we or how can we move from an erotics to a politics of disappointment? Uh, is it possible to make this move? Now, the question can be asked not just of Wong's films, but of Hong Kong cinema in general. It's noteworthy that the best examples of Hong Kong cinema, including the ones we have discussed, never deal directly with political issues. Uh, in Hong Kong cinema, only the mediocre films do that. Right? The mediocre would talk about politics uh, again and again and again. But in, in some of the, the better films, that's, uh, you never have this direct uh, 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 um, uh, um, uh, dealing with political uh, not because these issues are ignored, but because they're tracked by other means. Now, we find a more tangential relation to the political mediated by the analysis of, uh, of uh, 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 affective relations. 
So what looks sometimes like the bizarre nature of these relationships should not be understood simply as the result of psychological aberrations or perverse personal choices. I mean, this I think is all, uh, uh, you know, beside the point. The question to us, uh, therefore, is not what such behavior means in individual terms, but what social space and political space makes it possible. The focus then shifts towards the political contradictions of a space crisscrossed by the competing discourses of colonialism, nationalism, uh, internationalism, which makes the discussion of democracy in Hong Kong in the 60s, and of course, again today, uh, particularly uh, uh, difficult. Now, the contradictory meanings of uh, democracy in Hong Kong, however, does not make it a hollow term. The term may be confusing, but the issues it raises are more urgent than ever, uh, uh, requiring us to find a new language, perhaps, and a new angle. For example, if hope for democracy in Hong Kong, and maybe elsewhere as well, has so far been disappointed, right? If democracy, uh, 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 more often than not, has ended up in disappointment, it may be time to rethink a politics of hope by way of what we might call a politics of disappointment. And a politics of disappointment is not the opposite, right, of hope. It's not the negation uh, of hope. It, it, it's what you might call a critique of hope. Democracy disappoints not because great expectations are inevitably followed by a letdown, but because democracy is not in the appointed place where we expect it to be. Right? It's not where we think it is. And this, of course, is uh, uh, another example of what I'm trying to present as, the, as a, a critique of critique. 